Trump's loyalists clearly worried that Mueller's investigation could ensnare Trump's family or even the president himself. And they want to face down that existential threat now, right now. But Trump's lawyers aren't worried about that. And the lawyer's theory of the case here on the Trump side is that the farthest Mueller will really go would be to indict some former employees. And this is interesting because their view does overlap with some key reports in the New York Times. First, that bombshell that dropped on September 18th that Mueller already Ooh. told Paul Manafort he would be indicted, meaning he is a target of the investigation. And then this weekend's reporting in the Times that Mueller is building cases against Manafort and Flynn. Which raises the question, would Michael Flynn talk if granted immunity? It's not a hypothetical. We actually know he would, if you believe him, because he said he would. In that March 30th statement, Flynn's lawyer saying he had a story to tell if granted immunity, and otherwise he would plead the fifth. Never mind that back in the campaign days, you may remember Flynn had a different idea of what it means to plead the fifth. When you are given immunity, that means that you've probably committed a crime. And the Fifth Amendment is actually the dividing line here between the strategy of Trump's lawyers and these calls for more aggression from Trump loyalists. The Trump lawyers seem to think the farthest this goes is a few former staff. The loyalists worried those staff could get immunity and start talking. The other news today here, the Republican chair of the House Intel Committee, you may remember, who recused himself from the Russia inquiry, is now behind subpoenas to the partners of Fusion GPS, the research firm behind the famous dossier. And then there's the other story I told you here at the top of the hour about Trump and Russia. The president in a brand new interview saying that number one, none of this changed the vote with Russia, which so far is not in dispute. And then two, brand new, Donald Trump falsely suggesting the Senate Intel's interim update last week presented some kind of findings on collusion. <laughs> Quote, they just said there's absolutely been no collusion. They just said that yesterday, two days ago, Senate, there's been no collusion, he told Forbes. But that is not what the committee said. The GOP chair actually said they didn't know enough. The issue of collusion is still open, that we continue to investigate both intelligence and witnesses, and uh, that we're not in a position where we will come to any type of temporary finding on that until we've completed the process. Those words clearly contradict the president's new claim in this Forbes interview, which we just got in the newsroom. And before I sat down right here, our staff was able to reach out to the Senate Intel Committee to ask them about all this. And they said the senator's depiction of the facts speak for themselves. I'm joined now by two former Watergate prosecutors, Jill Weinbanks and Nick Ackerman, now partner at Dorsey Whitney. Also with me, Amaya Harris, a former senior advisor to Hillary Clinton. Uh, Jill, what does it mean when the president makes this kind of statement in the heat of this investigation? It means he's not listening carefully because it was very clear to anyone listening that the Senate Intelligence Committee said it is still investigating collusion and we can assume that Robert Mueller is still investigating collusion and obstruction in addition to collusion. So we're looking at two separate crimes and both could or could not involve the president. We won't know that until the investigation is completed and the office has shut down. At that point, we may know. Nick, he has every right to deny anything and make any statements about his own belief, views, or opinions. Um, does he have the same right and is it the same responsibility exercise, at least what his lawyers would tell him, uh, to mischaracterize, mislead about what the Senate Intel Committee just said? Well, it's typical of what he does. It's typical of what his family does. I mean, he has lied so many times about everything. Why would we be surprised that he lies about what the Senate Intelligence Committee did? He also kind of mischaracterized what this whole Russian collusion is about, trying to say that the Russians didn't actually impact any votes. The question isn't whether or not the Russians got into to the voting machines. The question is whether or not the Trump hmm. campaign colluded well, with that's the... With, interesting. With, Do you think he's trying to move the goalposts? I mean, the, the opening question was, did y'all team up illegally to do anything? And right. now it's, well, maybe it didn't change the votes. That's not the criminal line, is it? No, it's not. I mean, it's not what they're investigating. What they're looking at is whether or not they did this micro-targeting of Hillary Clinton voters to try and suppress the vote and to go after the Trump voters to get them out and did that in conjunction 
with the Russians. That's the issue. It doesn't have to do with people going into the voting machines and changing the votes. It may very well be that that was done, but that is not the central focus of this Russian collusion investigation. Maya? Well, you know, I just, uh, I, I think that's right, and I want to go back to, to something uh, that, that you were saying, which is about his lying, and I, you know, I'm sort of with um, Corker here that I don't know exactly why it is that, you know, Trump, you know, tweets uh, things and, and says things that aren't true, and mm -hmm. I think that to the to the point of what is unfolding uh, right now and the, the conflict that's happening between, you know, the kind of political strategy and the legal strategy, this is exactly why Trump just needs to stop talking, and I think that it is very risky for this White House um, for uh, to, to engage in a fight um, with Mueller and engage in a public fight over um, what's you know happening here with the investigation for a number of reasons. Um, you know, it, it, it can reaffirm the idea that there's an obstruction of justice going on here. You know, the tr with Trump off tweeting and his tweets could be you know taken as some you know kind of signaling to people to not you know participate uh, in 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 the investigation. It, it can actually piss off. Uh, jurors, uh, mm. the grand jurors, mm -hmm. who, who like you and me are regular people and who think that they're engaged in something that's important and legitimate and to have the subject of the probe out there uh, disputing it, calling it a fake process. They don't think they're involved in a fake process and the number one, you know, rule is you don't piss off the jury and, and you know, coming back to, to Trump and his previous behavior, it, it sort of, you know, creates more legal headaches like um, admissions, like you know, going on an interview and trying to dispute what's happening and effectively saying that the reason I fired Jim Comey is because he's looking into, into Russia. And so I just think that in this entire uh, arena that it would be well served for Trump to kind of stand down and stop commenting whether it is lying or misrepresenting or right. creating and legal Nick, problems. And Nick, do you think this tension that the AP is reporting between the political loyalists and the lawyers means anything in the long run? I think it means something to Donald Trump. I think it's going to make him probably go after Mueller again at some point, just because that's the way he is. Um, but the, the bottom line is, I agree with Maya. I mean, this is going to do nothing but create more problems for him. The, the, the prosecutors have the subpoena power with the grand jury. If the Trump lawyers don't play ball and they don't turn over documents, they're going to be held in contempt. They're going to go into court. And under U.S. v. Nixon, he's going to have to turn over any documents that are relevant to this investigation. Right, that's a privilege case that you know something about. I want to go to Jill here. Take a listen, Jill, to the discussion around Jeff Sessions, who again in this AP report also figures in because Donald Trump, according to this reporting, sitting there huddling with loyalists, is getting all this input about Russia and hitting harder. And he then says, well, blame Sessions, which is something, of course, we've heard. Uh, take a listen. I am disappointed in the Attorney General. Uh, he should not have recused himself. Sessions should have never recused himself. And if he would, if he was going to recuse himself, he should have told me before he took the job and I would have picked somebody else. I'm very disappointed with the Attorney General, uh, but we will see what happens. Time will tell. Time will tell. And Jill, this comes on a week where we have heard, thanks to NBC's reporting, uh, as well as uh, the Washington Post and other outlets, that Trump is bumping up against a lot of different concern about how many top people he can even get away with firing. Uh, the reports being that uh, General Kelly just wants him to kind of make it to Christmas without removing any other key cabinet officials, which keeps uh, presumably Tillerson and Sessions safe if he follows the rule. I think even if Sessions hadn't recused himself, you would have seen a cry for a special prosecutor. You needed an independent person, not the person who is reporting to the president, to investigate when the issues involve presidential culpability. And this issue of whether he should cooperate or not, I think has been clearly established by the Watergate case. He can stonewall all he wants, but eventually the courts are going to order him to comply. They are going to tell him he has to turn over the documents, so he may as well do it with less hostility than what happened in the Watergate case. It would help him more to just give them over. Now, of course, if the tapes, uh, or the evidence equal the tapes that Nixon had to turn over, it's going to be very damaging to him, whether he cooperates in giving them or he's forced to give them. Eventually the evidence will speak for itself and I think that we need to let the case go forward. We need to let Mueller continue his investigation and I think to something Maya said, 
that it's not just the grand jurors who are going to get pissed off. The voters are going to get pissed off. Even his base is eventually going to get tired of listening to him denying things that the facts prove are the opposite of what he's saying. And so it could hurt him electorally as well as in terms of the legal consequences. Uh, and Maya, on, on that, you know, sometimes there's so much news we don't get it all into the opening script. Uh, the other item here, uh, reports here according to Bloomberg, uh, that Facebook is reaching out to Congress and that Mark Zuckerberg is personally directly phoning members of Congress um, because there is going to be a lot more pressure on whether your campaign, which got more votes, um, but as they say, got them in the wrong places, um, was hobbled by a social media effort run out of the Kremlin um, that might have significantly impacted things. Well, you know, I, he's getting out front, I think, uh, in anticipation of that the Congress is actually going to take some steps to try to ensure that this doesn't happen again in the future, so in, in some ways in a, in a preemptive way. Uh, look, I think it's important for him to have, you know, apologize for his initial, uh, you know, uh, suggesting that, that Facebook had nothing to do with it. I think it's important that they've taken some steps. I think uh, it's important that Twitter and Google are entering the conversation. But I think we are so far from a solution yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at it, Twitter, Facebook, and Google are the three largest media companies that we have, even though they don't necessarily want to describe themselves that way. 67% of Americans actually say that's where they get their news. And so th these industry leaders need to exert some right. leadership and, step, and up. step up and actually institute some transparency, some accountability, um, and certainly some of the kinds of, you know, controls that we right. have in, in other And there will media. be hearings, so we're going to see what they say. I want to thank you, Maya Harris, Nick Ackerman, and Joe Weinbanks, each of you for our uh, segment tonight. Now, there are other reports today. Trump aides building a system to contain his emotional outburst. NBC's Hallie Jackson is here to break it down. And later, the story of Republican donors in revolt over congressional failures. We're not just going to talk about it. I'm going to speak to one of those donors in an exclusive on the beat. And later, the organization devoted to the IQ test is calling Trump's bluff. We will explain. I'm Ari Melbourne. And you're watching The Beat on MSNBC. When you look for things. How does the president expect his secretary of state to be effective when he's questioning his intelligence? Again, uh, he wasn't questioning the secretary of state's intelligence. He made he, he made a joke. Maybe you guys should uh, get a sense of humor and try it sometime. But um, he simply made a joke. LOL. Trump back to the joking defense. Forbes had asked him about Rex Tillerson calling him a moron, and Trump said he'd win an IQ test against his chief diplomat. So reporters raised the kerfuffle even during today's meeting with Henry Kissinger. Now the White House is laughing it off. There is also a club for people with high IQs, Mensa. Today they say they're offering Trump the chance to make good on his pledge and or joke, announcing, quote, American Mensa would be happy to hold an IQ testing session for President Trump and Secretary Tillerson. Trump also continuing his debate with the top Republican foreign policy voice in Congress, Bob Corker. Some have been covering this as more Trump feuding, but that may give him too much credit. He didn't start either of these, and both involve foreign policy Republicans concerned about the risk Trump poses as commander-in-chief, and they see more behind the scenes than the rest of us. Add to that the three reports today that Trump's staff are worried that he's a pressure cooker about to explode, a situation leading staff to create a series of, quote, guardrails they use to push the president away from rash decisions. Guardrails, which raises the question, is that how you say adult daycare in 2017? <laughs> I'm joined by Hallie Jackson, NBC's chief White House correspondent, Jamil Jaffer, former senior advisor to Senator Bob Corker himself, and Howard Dean, the former Vermont governor, doctor, and former DNC chair. Hallie, uh, walk us through what's happening here. Yeah, so you, you've seen what you've described here over the last, what, 24, 48, 72 hours here at the White House, here from President Trump. And so let me give you kind of an analogy here. What you have is a chief of staff, John Kelly, who has worked to try to streamline and structure the flow of information and these so-called processes. You hear it about a lot here at the White House in these private conversations, by which the president gets information, by which he's interacting with people here in order to kind of change uh, the way that the president was working from the prior chief of staff, right, into previous. That is not new, right? What seems to be new is that as uh, the president has had these sort of processes streamlined, he is looking now for other outlets by which to do what he used to do, which is get on the phone, he would see people, people were in and out of the West Wing, he would talk with friends from New York, talk with friends from wherever. 
because there's been uh, less of that, you're seeing the president work the outlets that he has, it seems, which is on Twitter, for example, talking mm. about Bob Corker, talking about Rex Tillerson in some of these interviews. And I can tell you just from my experience here, he's also uh, uh, more engaged with reporters to a degree. So, for example, when he's leaving to go on these trips out on the South Lawn, he'll stop and take several questions in these so-called pool sprays. Mm. He'll stop and talk with reporters, which is where some of these comments are coming from that have raised some of these eyebrows. Yeah, so Governor Dean, is he just seeking interaction, but with him that's dangerous? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes and yes, uh, it is dangerous. This is a guy who doesn't really have much sense of himself. I, he's a very strange person, I think. Um, and the Corker exchange is really incredible. I know Bob Corker fairly well, and um, I respect him. I you know, don't always agree with him, but I think if all the Republicans were like Bob Corker, we'd actually get something done. So how this got started, I uh, do not know, but it's bizarre. Uh, Jamil, you work for Bob Corker. W what was he trying to do here, and is it working? Look, uh, Ari, I think that Bob Cruz is a straightforward guy, and he's actually trying to help the president here. He he thinks the president has a decent agenda. I think he thinks the president's right on Iran, right on North Korea, you know, within, within you know, guardrails of, of what you might be doing. Um, and I think he thinks the president's right on tax cuts, you know, if, if balanced properly with spending cuts. And so I think Bob Corker wants to help the president move his agenda forward, but it's very hard to do when the president's lighting up members of his own administration mm -hmm. and, and Congress on Twitter in 140 and 140 characters And the president uh, said Bob Corker caused the Iran deal. Well, let me just I mean, let me just put that one to bed. Bob Corker was steadfastly opposed to the Iran deal. There's one person responsible for the Iran deal, and that is President Barack Obama. Bob Corker ensured that Congress got to see the deal, something President Obama didn't want. He got Congress to vote on it, and by bipartisan margins in both houses, including 15 so is, to 42 in the Senate, it, Jamil, is they Trump, voted against the deal. Is Trump confused or lying? Look, I, I'll just put it, put it point blank. Sarah Huckabee Sanders said it from the, from the podium. Donald Trump said it on Twitter, it's just not true. They ought to issue a correction. Hallie, I want you to listen to Newt Gingrich talking about all this. Also, uh, uh, FOT, friend of Trump. Take a listen. Trump automatically hits back at every and anybody. I mean, it's just it's an instinctive. Goes back to his New York days, uh, and it seems to be virtually uncontrollable. So, Hallie, do the guardrails control it? Can they? Uh, well, I think that what you've seen is that even when guardrails are tried to be put into place, the president does what the president wants to do because he feels he is the president. And I actually think what's most interesting from Newt Gingrich today, obviously a longtime ally of the president's, is that he also said that picking a fight with Senator Corker is not helpful. Newt Gingrich is correct. And I will tell you that based on conversations I have had late today here at the West Wing, folks understand uh, and acknowledge that they need every single Republican senator vote they can get on, for example, tax reform, which is what the president's traveling to Pennsylvania tomorrow to talk about. Uh, so they understand that, yeah, it's not great for the president to get in a fight with Senator Corker. At the same time, there is some uh, blame casting, if you will, that perhaps Senator Corker, the specter has been raised, is trying to get attention for what he wants out of this tax deal as it relates to deficits. And there's a reason why he's been uh, making a little bit more noise publicly than he has in the past. Well, I mean, I'll let Jamil back in on that. Jamil, it seems more like your old boss was actually just really worried about how Trump's attitude affects the foreign policy planning and potential wars the U.S. may get into. Look, Bob Corker loves this country. He wants America to be strong in the world. He's he's been free to felt free to criticize President Obama when President Obama was wrong, and he feels free to criticize this president when this president is wrong. And he wants the president to be successful. He's really been trying hard. I mean, since the campaign and since the president's been in office, Bob Corker has worked aggressively with the president to try and help him move the nation forward. And the president ought to respect that and work with the leadership in the Senate, whether it's Mitch McConnell or Ben Sass or Bob Corker or Rex Tillerson or Jeff Sessions in his own. So that's the that's the bummer of this. I mean, Howard, you listen to Jamil, um, who says Corker loves his country. I'm sure Jamil does. I'm sure we all do. Um, but the problem is, after acting this way and trying to do all these things and having this supposed general agreement with uh, Trump, it hasn't gotten Corker anything because he doesn't respect it. Uh, well, Trump is totally unreliable. His, he has no word that's worth anything. So you can't, I mean, look at the DACA stuff has gone back and forth and Pelosi and Trump thought, I mean, uh, Pelosi and Schumer thought they had a deal with Trump, and Trump thought so too. And now, you know, his yeah. word has never been any good, even when he was a real estate guy. It's, uh, you know, uh, Corker's a pretty straightforward guy. Is he a Paul? Sure, he's a Paul. He was a mayor. He, he actually got stuff done 
uh, by working together with all kinds of different people. Trump has no record like that whatsoever. Uh, Governor Howard Dean, Jamil Jaffer, and Hallie Jackson at the White House, thank you all. Interesting times. Now, Republicans in Congress just blew through a deadline for children's health care. This is important. Congressman Jan Schakowsky joins me next about the challenge ahead and political burnout. It's real. Trump can cause it. And there are solutions. We have an expert on strategy and mental peace later in the show. Turn to an urgent health care issue. While Republicans' failure to repeal Obamacare was big political news, Republicans just blew through a key deadline that has American children on pace to lose their health care coverage. Nine million children impacted since Republicans missed the deadline. Now, the actual money starts running out in just 51 days. Here at the beat, we are tracking it with this countdown clock. And this is not typically a partisan issue. Republican Orrin Hatch created the program with Ted Kennedy. I think a children's health is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. It's an American issue. Let me tell you something. I think it's one of the most important things we can do is to help people who cannot help themselves. We're talking about kids here who cannot help themselves. We're talking about kids here, and presidents in both parties have signed bills continuing the program over the next 20 years. In fact, we began covering this on The Beat last week when I spoke to a father who says his daughter could lose her epilepsy medicine if Congress doesn't act. It's good at health insurance, it's reliable health insurance, and it's the kind of health insurance I was able to count on when my daughter began to have seizures and was able to focus on caring for her and not worrying about how it would pay the costs. Democratic Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky of Illinois serves on the committee that oversees this program. Uh, thank you for joining me for something I know we, we both think is important. What is the holdup? Well, first of all, let me just thank you because so few, so little focus is on this issue right now. I think the Republicans want it that way. Um, the holdup is in so-called the pay for. How are we going to pay to cover nine million children in this country? You talk to that parent. Parents all over the country are in real distress right now, wondering if their children are going to get that health care. What they wanted to do. Um, in order to pay for this program was to cut Medicare. That's where they wanted to get it. And th what we call the prevention fund, things that go to immunization and other things that children need as well. And, and so it was really a cynical move right now. And, and they knew, of course, for two years that the September 30th deadline wa was coming up, but they were so busy trying to repeal Obamacare that they just didn't have time to get to it. And and now we're just fighting over uh, the, the kinds of unacceptable pay-fors that they want. Uh, uh, Congresswoman, uh, you know, I like to try to be fair to everyone and describe things fairly and people can make up their own minds. Honestly, what you're describing and what I've read is that the current position of House Republicans is to hold this money hostage for children unless other cuts are made to health care. Is, is there any other way to say it? No, I think that would be a good way to say it. I mean, they are taking nine million children and saying, well, you know, if we can't get the cuts in, uh, in Medicare, if we can't take money out of this prevention fund, then I'm sorry, then the children are going to, to have to suffer. And then turn around and say, it's really the Democrats that don't want to sit down and negotiate this. You know, Ari, since 1997, since the Children's Health Insurance Program, the CHIP program passed, 68 percent dropped in the number of uninsured children in this country. This is such an important, important... Uh, and, and there are places to get money. Um, if we wanted to, to get some real money to fund these kinds of programs, like the community health centers and the CHIP program, we could look to the pharmaceutical industry, the cost of drugs. There's plenty of money there that we could use to pay for these programs. Uh, Congresswoman, we know that uh, Congress has blown through the deadline because of the majority there. We are tracking it here 51 days uh, uh, obviously important to a lot of people. Congressman Jan Schakowsky, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ari. There's a new report in the Washington Post busting President Trump for making, count him up, 1,300 false claims since election. But how do fact checkers avoid burnout? We are really asking and will explain. Also later, a beat exclusive, a major Republican donor says he is cutting the party off. He'll tell us why. And Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie joining the chorus of public accusers against Harvey Weinstein. I have a report on that at the end of the show and some new words from actress Mira Servino that everyone needs to hear.
Do you ever get tired of this political era? Do you ever worry about burning out? Imagine how the fact checkers feel. All they do is fact check a president who, according to a new report in the Washington Post, has made history with 1,318 false or misleading claims just since he's taken office. That is five falsehoods a day, and that's assuming Trump is as misleading on the weekends as he is the rest of the week. We've signed more bills, and I'm talking about through the legislature, than any president ever. They were people protesting very quietly the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. They had a permit. The other group didn't have a permit. The people of this country want tax cuts. They want lower taxes. We're the highest taxed nation in the world. Those false claims can be enraging or exhausting, especially because as a reality show character and politician, Trump feeds off emotional outrage, which raises the burnout question. Are you falling into Trump's trap by getting mad about Trump? You know, so far as president, he seems to be saying to the nation, I'm not a leader, I just troll a lot. And some people are tired of being trolled and want to drop out and turn away from the news or politics. But experts say, the key to avoiding burnout is approaching Trump or all politics in a mindful way. Author Robert Wright arguing outrage feeds Trump while more focused activism can address what got Trump elected, globalization, trade, immigration, and technological challenges. Wright is our special guest on The Beat. He's the author of books on both game theory and Buddhism. And we're also joined by one of our favorites, the Harvard Kennedy Schools, Leah Wright Rigor. Thank you both, uh, Robert what kind of activism do you think both works and avoids this burnout? Well, I think uh, mindful activism does. Um, first of all, in the sense that I think mindfulness meditation can help prevent burnout. It can make you more emotionally resilient. But I, I think to, to leave it at that kind of sells it short. I, I think that uh, being mindful, and to some extent I just mean in the everyday English sense of the word of being kind of careful and attentive to all relevant factors. I think being mindful, mm -hmm. like when you're on social media, for example, um, can help you engage in a way that is more constructive from your point of view. And uh, if you uh, are, are an opponent of Trump's, as, as I am, uh, it can keep you from being emotionally reactive in a way that feeds his, his narrative hmm. and I think consolidates his base. Well, you say that, use that word, and some people say, what does that mean? I mean, Barack Obama is known for being very deliberate and thoughtful and mindful. Uh, and Leah, he has spoken out about when people get frustrated, think back to what so many people have been through and how much more difficult it may have been previously. Here he was on the Selma anniversary. If you think nothing's changed in the past 50 years, ask somebody who lived through the Selma or Chicago or Los Angeles of the 1950s. <laughs> ask the female CEO who once might have been assigned to the secretarial pool if nothing's changed. Ask your gay friend if it's easier to be out and proud in America now than it was 30 years ago. Leo, what do you think the Obama approach would be here to avoid burnout? <laughs> well, you know, Barack Obama in the past uh, past couple months ha hasn't been able to help himself and has, has spoken out a few times, too. Um, so I do think that it, part of this is, you know, part of what Obama is saying is, you know, uh, uh, think about what our ancestors have done. Think about that kind of resilience. With that said, the circumstances, the moment that we're in right now, are, are in some ways kind of uniquely different, which calls for a uniquely different approach. So I think, you know, one of the things that, that we can talk about, we can really talk about, um, is how to kind of alleviate or how to kind of deal with this idea of outrage and how to deal with fatigue. And, you know, one of the, the things that we can do, we can talk about, you know, pulling back and using social media strategically, especially Especially now that we know that Russia has, you know, Russia intervened um, in Facebook and Twitter and Google uh, to sow discord and, you know, take advantage of partisanship and polarization. But the other thing that I think is really important, and this goes to, to Robert's uh, point as well, is not allowing the chaos.
chaos, right, and the, the kind of uh, the, the craziness of uh, the president and the president's White House, of the White House, so the chaos of the White House, mm. to really determine, um, uh, you know, your response or your reaction. So really figuring out um, uh, how not to let uh, the White House drive the narrative. I think a lot of that has to do with the outrage and the fatigue that people are feeling, particularly since on any given day, Trump wakes up and determines the agenda for the day just by the the amount of tweets that he sends out. So Robert, part of this yeah. is putting the agency and putting the hand, back in the hands of the people. So Robert, how do you do that? Uh, how do you stay authentic but not be ruled by what you might call, I guess, uh, political emotions every day? Well, I think the first step is to recognize that often our outrage serves Trump's purposes. I mean, I, I think uh, political polarization serves his purposes to mm. some extent. And certainly, uh, you know, I just wrote this piece on uh, what I call mindful resistance in Vox, and I, I used this example of a tweet that got like 7,000 retweets. And the tweet was something like, it was just like, Trump is a terrible person, stoking the terrible instincts of terrible followers. And I just made the point that, you know, when we send the message that we consider all of his followers terrible people, um, that reinforces his narrative that mm. these snooty coastal elites hold his followers in contempt. That's, the, that's what helped him get elected. And the, the other thing is that when we essentialize his followers that way and think that they're all racist or all stupid, when in fact it's much more complicated than that, uh, we're not going to think clearly about what exactly got him elected and how we can keep well, him from getting elected uh, again. And I, now, I mean, as for the yeah. question, oh, yeah. I mean, as for the question of how you do it, uh, I think, first of all, just being conscious of the problem gets you somewhere. But I also genuinely think that actual mindfulness meditation, I have a daily practice, makes you more aware of your feelings, such as outrage. You're more likely to observe right. them welling up. And, and then be less reactive and, and more reflective it's, and actually pause and decide, is it, is it good to retweet this? It's, it's fascinating what you say and I think it resonates as well because if the typical liberal thing is not to try to give everyone a judgment and never a second chance, right, then you're not defined by one mistake or one vote even if people strongly disagree on the vote and what it represents. Uh, Robert Wright, I hope you come back uh, and Leo Wright Rigor, thank you both. Thank you. Now we want to ask, how are you avoiding burnout? You can tell us at Facebook or Twitter at The Beat with Ari, or you can email me. What are you doing to avoid political burnout right now? And still ahead, our exclusive wealthy Republican donors revolting against the GOP. I'm going to speak to a GOP mega donor threatening to pull the plug on Republican campaign funding. And later, Angelina Jolie and Gwyneth Paltrow joining many other women publicly accusing Harvey Weinstein of sexual misconduct. That story later tonight. On the beat, Republicans facing a revolt from top donors threatening to cut off funding. My exclusive guest is Dan Eberhardt, who says he'll pull his support if Republicans don't get their act together. Eberhardt is the very first GOP insider quoted in an explosive Bloomberg article about the backlash for the GOP with, quote, no legislative wins despite their majority. The report noting Republicans are blowing a once-in-a-century chance to expand their majority. Where will disaffected donors go? Well, most aren't interested in Democrats, but Steve Bannon is now recruiting funders to back candidates to challenge incumbent Republicans. A headache for McConnell and Paul Ryan as Bannon wages a assault on the Republican establishment. Now, according to federal records, finance and oil executive Dan Eberhardt has donated more than $160,000 to Republicans since 2012, and now he says he is sick of Republican leaders squandering this moment. Uh, welcome, and Dan, do congressional Republicans or Senate Republicans have to worry about losing your support? And have you met uh, with Steve Bannon about all this? Uh, good evening, Ari. Uh, thank you for having me. I mean, I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, obviously, the congressional Republicans have, uh, you know, ac accomplished uh, quite a bit more. But in the Senate, things seem to be stuck. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe this year something like 370 bills have been passed in the House. And I think about 280 of those are still sitting in the Senate. Obviously, the most notable of those is uh, the, you know, Obamacare um, or some kind of repeal and replace or a quantifiable, you know, fix to uh, Obamacare, which I think has been a disaster. But there's also many more bills that have, have received less headlines. You think Mitch McConnell is bad at his job? Uh, well, I, I think that, you know, I, I liked his strategy and, and how that played out with Gorsuch, but I think that 
I feel pretty frustrated right now. I feel like the dog caught the car uh, and didn't have a plan in terms of repealing and replacing Obamacare or fixing Obamacare. You know, we've got the Senate majority, 52 senators, also potentially the tie-breaking vote if we need it. And Mitch McConnell doesn't seem to be able to get the caucus to uh, walk in the right line. You know, for, for me, I feel like the Obamacare uh, repeal and replace mantra has been something that the Republicans have told uh, donors, they've told, they've told voters uh, so many times over the years that they've elevated it to where it's core to the brand. And I think that the, the failure to get something done in Washington now that they have both houses and the executive branch it's just a travesty. Right. And I, I mean, you're you're a business guy. It's it, repealing Obamacare was core to the Republicans' marketing. I don't know if it's core to the product anymore for the reasons you just outlined. That they're in charge uh, of all the political branches. And, and what about Steve Bannon here, who's trying to give them more headaches? Has has he met with you? Has he approached you for money? Uh, yeah. So I, I uh, met with Steve Bannon last week, and and I'll I'll keep a private conversation private, but. Um, you know, I, I think he's a, a brilliant strategist, and I think he feels emboldened by what happened, um, you know, in Alabama. And I think that, quite frankly, I think that, uh, you know, McConnell's star has faded a little bit, and Bannon's star is rising uh, with what's happened. I think that hmm. the, move, the move that the Senate Leadership Fund and McConnell made in Alabama uh, has completely backfired. I think it, hmm. as opposed to saving one of their own, I think that they've emboldened Bannon and emboldened a, a, a bunch of conservative voters uh, across America that are ready for change and they're they're wanting to use the majority instead of just kind of sit there uh, in DC and be the majority they want to use the majority and they want to move forward would you give more money to McConnell or his picks at this point uh, I, pr at, at the, the way I feel right now probably not look I'm a lifelong Republican I, I want us to win I think we've got the best ideas for America and the best ideas for the, uh, everyone's future, but uh, I'm extremely frustrated that if they aren't going to use the majority and don't have a, a, an actual plan that they can use to pass legislation, then what's what's the point? You know, uh, Mr. Eberhardt, we talk a lot about the politics there and the GOP civil war and also uh, the folks on the inside uh, doing the meetings and moving the money around, which is a part of our politics. Very interesting to get some of your perspective. Uh, thanks for being on the beat. Uh, thank you for having me. Ahead, Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie join this growing list of women accusing Harvey Weinstein of misconduct. I have a report on that important story up ahead. Harvey Weinstein, who was fired from his own company Sunday after the New York Times reported extensive allegations of sexual harassment, facing new allegations and leaks about his conduct today. The very latest comes from two of Hollywood's most famous actors, Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie, who both say Weinstein abused his power to harass them. They gave their accounts to the New York Times, and those accounts come on the same day the New Yorker published the results of a 10-month investigative report by Ronan Farrow, who's also a contributing correspondent for NBC News. With accounts from 13 different women alleging Weinstein harassed, attacked, or assaulted them, and these include allegations of forcible sexual contact. The article details how 16 former or current Weinstein Company employees say they observed inappropriate office conduct or sexual harassment, painting a picture of a widespread office culture of coercion, harassment, and intimidation. Now, Weinstein's representatives have issued a blanket denial of any, quote, non-consensual sex or acts of retaliation to The New Yorker, saying any allegations of non-consensual sex are unequivocally denied. There were never any acts of retaliation against any women. The report also includes a leaked recording, which The New Yorker magazine says NYPD made while investigating claims in 2015 that Weinstein groped a young woman he met previously at a social event. What do we have to do here? Nothing. I'm going to take a shower. You sit there and have a drink. Water. Don't drink. Uh, and can I stay water. on the bar? No. You must come here now. No. Please. No, I don't want to. I'm not doing anything with you. I'm, I'm I very know. embarrassing. I I'm sorry. I, I don't know. No, yesterday was a kind of aggressive for me. I, know. I, I need to know a person to I be touched. I won't do a thing. I don't want Everything, please, I swear I won't. Just sit with me. Don't embarrass me in the hotel. I'm here all the time. I sit know, with me, but I, I don't promise. want to. Please sit there. Please. One minute. No, I ask I can't. You. Go to the bathroom. Please, I don't want to do something I don't want go to. Go to the bathroom. Hey, come here. Listen to me. I want to go downstairs. I'm not going to do anything. You'll never see me again after this. That's it. If you don't, if you embarrass me in this hotel, I'm not embarrassing stay. you. Just it's just walk. that I don't, I don't feel comfortable. I mean, don't have a fight with me. It's not nice. Please, I'm not going to do anything. I swear, my 
your children. Please come in. I'm everything. I'm a famous I'm, guy. I'm feeling very uncomfortable right Please now. Please come in now. And one minute. And if you want to leave, when the guy comes with my jacket, Why you yesterday you touched my breast? Please, I'm sorry. You just come on. I'm used to that. Are you used Please. to that? Yes, come in. Because no, but I'm not used to that. I won't do it again. Come on. Sit here. Sit here for a minute. Please. No, I don't want to. If you do this now, you will embarrass me. Guys, I mean, I will never do another thing to you. Five minutes. Don't ruin your friendship with me for five minutes. It's, I know, but it's kind of like it's too much for me. I can't. Please, you're making a big scene here. No, Please. but I want to. Prosecutors say they investigated that case thoroughly, and they say they did not have sufficient evidence to charge. Many of the accounts emphasize that Weinstein was a powerful and connected businessman, and he aggressively used that power, allegedly, 